going to tell you what's going to happen next. This is going to happen this year. So get ready. It's smarter than you. And it's going to be a hell of a lot smarter than you in two years. So you can get ready for that too. The bigger the toy, the smarter you better be to use it. So that's, and that's worth thinking about because we're coming up with some pretty damn big toys. The perils of artificial intelligence loom before us like a shadowy specter. And Jordan Peterson is sounding the alarm, warning of a future where machines and algorithms may hold our fate in their digital hands. Is we're going to be producing equally revolutionary transformations, but at a much smaller scale of time. Is the rise of AI the greatest threat to humanity? Jordan Peterson thinks so, so let's have a look. Right now, Chad GPT only uses language. So to the degree it's intelligent, it's intelligent because of the intelligence that's encoded only in language. And if the linguistic corpus, so the body of text that we've all produced, is biased and warped in some way, that'll be built into the Chat GPT system. AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon and that's basically what scientists do right because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world and if the hypothesis in the world fit then you think well that's scientifically verified and Keller thinks that that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon the clinical psychologist's warning about the unchecked power of artificial intelligence sends shivers down our spines, reminding us of the importance of safeguarding the future of humanity. You'll see, I mean, Elon Musk, one of the things he's working on, see, he, he thinks that the world will be controlled by whoever produces the most functional AI system the fastest, because there'll be a first, a first mover advantage. And one of the things Musk has been working on for a long time are distributed AI systems so that you'll have your own artificial intelligence to protect you against, well, let's say against Google's artificial intelligence, for starters. Yeah, or, or the CCP's artificial intelligence, because you can bet your hat they're working on that about as fast as they possibly can. Now, will that be a net benefit in terms of freedom of speech? I don't know, things are so unstable right now and changing so rapidly, I, I can't really claim to see more than about six months to a year ahead at most. I mean, no, not, not only because things are so stable and strange politically, but there are things, and everyone in the audience should know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just gonna make your hair stand on end within the next year. Because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months, that it, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable. You're gonna see things you just can't possibly. How many of you clap? How many of you know what chat GBT is? Okay. So well, I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what Chad GPT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. This is a big deal. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically, is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. So it's derived its models of the world from the analysis of human speech, essentially. It, it isn't using real world data yet, but that will be happening certainly within the next year. And chat GPT, analyzes a very large corpus of text, and that corpus is growing all the time. Now, it's already sophisticated enough. I went on to it last week, and I said, okay, some of you know I, I've written these books, 12 Rules for Life, and then Beyond Order, 12 more rules, because, you know, you can't have enough rules. And I asked it, this is what I asked it to do. I said, write me an essay that's a 13th rule for Beyond Order, written in a style that combines the King James Bible with the Tao Te Ching. That's a pretty difficult, that's pretty difficult to pull off, you know? Any one of those things is hard. The 
intersection of all three, that's impossible. Well, it wrote it in about three seconds, four pages long, and it isn't obvious to me, for better or worse, that I would be able to tell that I didn't write it. Right, right, and okay, and that's pretty impressive, although, you know, maybe not its relationship to what I've written, but the fact that it could do that grammatically perfectly, right, and quite impressive philosophically. I also had it write an essay on the intersection between the Taoist version of ethical morality and the ethics that are outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, which it just nailed, got that dead right, Br brilliant. Again, it took it about three seconds. There was a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla. He asked GPT, chat GPT, said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a, engineer at Twitter, what 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And, oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. That's already there. So then a university professor did this. He thought, oh, that's interesting. Any student will be able to write any essay on any topic with chat GPT. And, uh, Someone gave it an SAT, by the way, and it scored about as well as the average student in a well-functioning public university. So that's how smart it is. So that's basically an IQ test. He said, write me an essay, gave it a topic, wrote the essay. He said, now grade it. Said, if we can automate the students, we should be able to automate the professors too. And so it provided a complete comprehensive analysis of its own essay with grade. It wrote, a, Someone else asked it, write the screenplay and describe the characters for the next $900 million Hollywood blockbuster. It's like, bang, plot, characterizations. Then someone else took the descriptions of the actors and said, generate computer, photorealistic computer images for each actor. And all the AI systems could do that. And so that means all this pathology is multiplied immensely by our, tech, by our technological might. And I've thought recently that virtualization enables psychopathy. So in normal social situations, if you're a narcissistic Machiavellian and you push it too hard, someone will absolutely hit you. And that will be the end of it. And most of the time it's cowards who take that route and it doesn't take much intimidation to stop them. Just the hint of appropriate, just retaliation will keep them silent. But Online, especially if you're anonymous, that's all stripped away, and so the psychopaths can have free reign. And part of the reason that our culture is being torn apart at the moment is because virtualization enables psychopathy. And so that's a big problem. Now, now we're, you know, we're primitive children on the ethical front with the tools of gods, and that's very, very dangerous. In, in fact, it might be fatally dangerous. And so, one of the things that Jung attempted to do in his work was to help people understand that it was necessary for us to take on an ethical responsibility that was commensurate with our technological power and that that would require something like a something like a, the deepest of all possible religious revaluations right the revaluation of good and evil to use the Nietzschean phrase as an as a what medication for the death of God a very serious set of ideas and you think we're powerful now, man. You wait till the AI giant starts to stroll around the earth and that's coming. Like you will absolutely see that in your lifetime. You'll probably see it in the next two or three years because that technology is moving so quickly that even those who are on top of it can't keep up. So, and I would say we better get our act together because we could make this world quite the heavenly place, but there's a lot more pathways to hell than there are to heaven. And you know, by the time World War II hit, we were pretty damn technologically powerful. We could take out a lot of the world in a very short period of time, but that was nothing compared to what we can do now. So we're, we're really at a crossroads. We could have everything we could dream of if we were careful, but we could have a nightmare beyond contemplation if we're not. And so I would say, and I would say this is all on you, right? Because also, as we become technologically more powerful, every single individual becomes more powerful. 
Well, the other thing too, and, and this is a weird problem in some sense, the robotics engineer types, they're thing people, right? I mean, the big classes of interest are interest in things versus interest in people. Some of my best friends are thing people. Yeah, right. And uh, thing people are very, very clear, logical thinkers, and they're very outcome-oriented and practical. Now, and that's all good. That makes the machinery and keeps it functioning. But there's a human side of the equation. And, and you get the extreme thing people and you think, yeah, well, what about the human here? And when we're talking about, we've been talking about the necessity of having a technological enterprise embedded in an ethic. And you can ignore that, like most of the time, right? You can ignore the overall ethic in some sense when you're toying around with your toys. But when you're building an artificial intelligence, it's like, well, that's not a toy. That might be... Toy becomes the monster very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And, and this is a whole new kind of monster. And maybe it's already here. You've thought a lot about AI systems. It's like, don't you become what you practice? And the answer to that is, well, absolutely. We even know the neurology. It's like when you first formulate a concept, huge swaths of your cortex are lit up, so to speak. But as you practice that, first of all, the right hemisphere stops participating, and then the, the, the left participates less and less until you build specialized machinery for exactly that conceptual frame. And then you start to see it, not just think it. And so if you're telling the same lies over and over, who do you think you're fooling? Think, well, I can withstand my own lies. Not if they're effective lies. And if they're effective enough to fool millions of people, and then they reflect them back to you, what makes you think you're going to be able to withstand that? We may be making, when we're doomsaying, let's say, and I'm, I'm not saying there's no place for that, we're making the presumption of something like a, a zero-sum competitive landscape, right? Is that the the idea and the idea behind movies like like the Terminator is that there is only so much resources and the machines and the human beings would have to fight over it. And you can see that that, that could easily yeah, be a preposterous assumption. Now, I, I think that, that one of the fundamental points you're making, though, is also um, there will definitely be people that will weaponize AI. And those weaponized AI systems will have as their goal something like the destruction of human beings, at least under some circumstances. And then there's the possibility that that will get out of control because the most effective systems at destroying human beings might be the ones that win, let's say. And that, that could happen independently yeah. of whether or yeah. not it is a true zero-sum competition. One of the things that you might think about that could be dangerous on the AI front is that we optimize the manner in which we, inter we interact with our electronic gadgets to capture short-term attention, right? Because there's a difference between getting what you want right now, right now, yeah. and getting what you need in some more mature sense across a reasonable span of time. And one of the things that does seem to be happening online, and I think it is driven by the development of AI systems, is that we're, we're assaulted by systems that parasitize our short-term attention yeah. and at the expense of longer-term attention. And I, if the AI systems emerge to optimize attentional grip, it isn't obvious to me that they're going to optimize for the attention that works over the medium to long run. Right? So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. This is going to happen this year, so get ready. Okay, so now we have an AI model that can extract a model of the world from the entire corpus of language. All right, and it's, it's smarter than you, and it's going to be a hell of a lot smarter than you in two years. So you can get ready for that too. But it's not that smart yet because it's just a humanities professor at the moment. It doesn't test its linguistic knowledge against the real world. That's what a scientist does, right? You come up with a theory that's linguistically predicated and then you throw it against the world and see if it sticks. And then the world tells you whether or not your linguistic construction is valid. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic 
constructions against the world and so they'll practice just like scientists and the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well because they'll be able to model human action and so and all of that's going to come down the pipes within the next year so hang on to your hats ladies and gentlemen because what did my friend Jonathan Pajot say giants are going to walk the earth once more and we're going to live through that maybe we're at least still human once the machines can lock you out <laughs> you are in such trouble Jordan Peterson has been warning us for weeks and the moment of truth is now upon us the decisions we make in the next eight days will shape our destiny for years to come we're going to be producing equally revolutionary transformations but at a much smaller scale of time it's a race against time and the stakes couldn't be any higher the fate of our country our economy our very way of living hang in the balance you see these signs of this everywhere you know when you go through airports now there's a lot of automated barriers you show your passports like well these are automated barriers what if you can't go through them well that's the situation for many people in china it's like what are you going to do you're going to argue with the machine <laughs> like you just cannot imagine how screwed you are we stand on the edge of a precipice staring down into the abyss jordan peterson's been trying to prepare us for this moment but are we ready to face what's coming jim figures that the ai systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon and that's basically what scientists do right because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world and if the hypothesis in the world fit then you think well that's scientifically verified and keller thinks that that ai systems will be able to do that pretty soon peterson's prophetic words have ignited a sense of urgency then I personally feel can't be ignored. The idea that we have such a limited amount of time left before something catastrophic occurs is downright terrifying. I, I, I don't think I have to say. Now, chat GPT only uses language. So to the degree it's intelligent, it's intelligent because of the intelligence that's encoded only in language. And if the linguistic corpus so the body of text that we've all produced is biased and warped in some way that'll be built into the chat gpt system in times of crisis it's often the voices of reason that provide us with the strength and guidance that we need to move forward so they're always after the next new thing as fast as possible so it's a machine that's speeding along as fast as a machine possibly can and and God only knows where it's headed in some sense, right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to keep track. And we don't even know what these things are. Jordan Peterson's warning may be unsettling, but it's also a reminder that we still have the time to make a difference. Peterson's statement reminds us that time's precious. It's a, it's a precious commodity and we gotta use it wisely. We cannot afford to waste a single moment on frivolous pursuits or petty disagreements. You know, you hear babies have no theory of mind. It's like, uh, yeah, no, they can imitate. That's pretty bloody amazing, man. Like, you haven't seen robots that can do that yet. Although there are robots now that you can teach by moving their, their arms. You move their arms, and then they'll do it. And so you can actually program them by moving them, and then they'll just repeat it. And so they're getting damn close to imitation. They're really getting close, and then look the hell out, man because they're going to be imitating each other as well as us and they're going to do it so fast you just won't be able to believe it so that's coming you know the guys that are building the autonomous cars like they don't think they're building autonomous cars they know perfectly well what they're doing they're building fleets of mutually intercommunicating autonomous robots and each of them will be able to teach the other because their nervous system will be the same. And when there's 10 million of them, when one of them learns something, all 10 million of them will learn it at the same time. So they're not going to have to be very bright before they're very, very, very smart. Because us, you know, we'll learn something. You have to imitate it. It's like, God, that's hard. Or I have to explain it to you and you have to understand it and then you have to act it out. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform. But robots, they are. 
And so once those things get a little bit smart, they're not going to stop at a little bit smart for very long. They're going to be unbelievably smart, like overnight. So, and they're imitating the hell out of us right now too, because we're teaching them how to understand us every second of every day. The net is learning what we're like. It's watching us. It's communicating with us. It's imitating us. And it's going to know, it already knows in some ways more about us than we know about ourselves. You know, there's lots of reports already of people getting um, pregnancy ads or ch ads for infants, sometimes before they know they're pregnant, but often before they've told their families. And the way that that happens is the net is watching what they're looking at and inferring with its artificial intelligence. And so maybe you're pregnant and that's just tilting you a little bit, right? To interest in things that you might not otherwise be interested in. The net tracks that and it tells you what you're, what you're after. It does that by offering you an advertisement. So it's reading your unconscious mind. So, well, so that's what's happening. But there are things, and everyone on, in the audience should know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just gonna make your hair stand on end within the next year. Because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months that it, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable. You're gonna see things you just can't possibly. How many of you clap? How many of you know what chat GBT is? Okay. So well, I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what chat GBT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. This is a big deal. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. So it's derived its models of the world from the analysis of human speech, essentially. It, it isn't using real world data yet but that will be happening certainly within the next year. And ChatGPT analyzes a very large corpus of text and that corpus is growing all the time. Now it's already sophisticated enough. I went on to it last week and I said, okay, some of you know I, I've written these books, 12 Rules for Life and then Beyond Order, 12 more rules because you know, you can't have enough rules. And I asked it, this is what I asked it to do. I said, write me an essay that's a 13th rule for beyond order, written in a style that combines the King James Bible with the Tao Te Ching. That's a pretty difficult, that's pretty difficult to pull off, you know? Any one of those things is hard. The intersection of all three, that's impossible. Well, it wrote it in about three seconds, four pages long, and it isn't obvious to me, for better or worse, that I would be able to tell that I didn't write it. Right, right, and okay, and that's pretty impressive, although, you know, maybe not its relationship to what I've written, but the fact that it could do that grammatically perfectly, right, and quite impressive philosophically. I also had it write an essay on the intersection between the Taoist version of ethical morality and the ethics that are outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, which it just nailed, got that dead right, Br brilliant. Again, it took it about three seconds. There was a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla. He asked GPT, chat GPT, said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a, engineer at Twitter, what 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. This is gonna happen this year, so get ready. Okay, so now we have an AI model that can extract a model of the world from the entire corpus of language. All right, and it's, it's smarter than you. And it's going to be a hell of a lot smarter than you in two years. So you can get ready for that too. But it's not that smart yet because it's just a humanities professor at the moment. It doesn't 
test its linguistic knowledge against the real world. That's what a scientist does, right? You come up with a theory that's linguistically predicated and then you throw it against the world and see if it sticks. And then the world tells you whether or not your linguistic construction is valid. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world, and so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well, because they'll be able to model human action. And so, and all of that's going to come down the pipes within the next year. So hang on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen, because what did my friend Jonathan Pajot say? Giants are going to walk the earth once more, and we're going to live through that, maybe. We may be making, when we're doomsaying, let's say, and I'm, I'm not saying there's no place for that, we're making the presumption of something like a, a zero-sum competitive landscape, right? Is that the, the idea, and the idea behind movies like like uh, the Terminator is that there is only so much resources and the machines and the human beings would have to fight over it. And you can see that that, that could easily yeah, be a preposterous assumption. Now, I, I think that, that one of the fundamental points you're making though is also, um, there will definitely be people that will weaponize AI. And those weaponized AI systems will have as their goal something like the destruction of human beings, at least under some circumstances. And then there's the possibility that that will get out of control because the most effective systems at destroying human beings might be the ones that win, let's say. And that, that could happen independently yeah. of whether or yeah. not it is a true zero-sum competition. <laughs> One of the things that you might think about that could be dangerous on the AI front is that we optimize the manner in which we, inter we interact with our electronic gadgets to capture short-term attention, right? Because there's a difference between getting what you want right now, right now, yeah. and getting what you need in some more mature sense across a reasonable span of time. And one of the things that does seem to be happening online, and I think it is driven by the development of AI systems, is that we're, we're assaulted by systems that parasitize our short-term attention yeah. and at the expense of longer-term attention. And I, if the AI systems emerge to optimize attentional grip, it isn't obvious to me that they're going to optimize for the attention that works over the medium to long run. There isn't, it's way worse than anything Kafka ever imagined. Because at least with Kafka, there was bureaucrats, faceless though they may have been, they were at least still human. Once the machines can lock you out, ho, 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 you are in such trouble. And we're speeding towards that with, uh, with an immense lack of, of care the autonomous cars that are being developed, you know, people still think about those as cars, but that isn't what they are. They're autonomous self-learning robots. And the fact that they happen to take the form of cars at the moment is almost irrelevant. You know, they're no more cars than cars were horseless buggies, right? They're a whole new thing. And what's really interesting about robots like that is that they basically, they're all identical, right? More or less. And what that means is that when one learns something, every one of them learns it at the same time. And so even if they're not very bright, if there's 10 million of them, or 100 million of them, and they're all learning one thing a day, that's 100 million new things a day that every one of them is learning. And so they're mapping the road and they're learning how to operate in a natural environment, which is a really big deal. Like it's a really, really big deal. They're learning to map the perception of the world onto action which is really the definition, a, re a good definition in some sense of intelligence. And so, and then everyone in Silicon Valley is rushing to produce artificially intelligent systems, which are being tried out in 50 different ways, 100 different ways now. And then they're also rushing to build more and more powerful computational devices as fast as they possibly can. And there's a huge arms race in that direction. And arms races, of course, well, they tend to, they tend to progress perhaps exponentially. And so all these things are happening at the same time. Well, we have no idea what that, we have no idea what that means. We don't even know 
if we need to be worried about Facebook, because God only knows if it'll even exist in five years. It could even be the same with Google. So, we, you know, we're worried about machines that are changing so fast that we can't figure out what exactly we should be worried about. Because, I mean, who was thinking about YouTube five years ago? No one. It's like cute cat videos. Who cares about YouTube? But it turns out that YouTube is an unbelievably powerful social force because it makes the spoken word as universally transmissible and as permanent as the written word, right? So it's a Gutenberg revolution. And it might even be more profound than Gutenberg revolution because it's possible that people can listen better than they can read. And they can listen when they're doing other things, which is what happens in the podcast world. And lots of my students now listen to podcasts instead of listening to music, or they listen to podcasts instead of reading. You know, they speed them up. I mean, these are massive, massive technological changes, and they're all happening in parallel. We have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be. So my concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically. And that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God, but that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us. And I've thought recently that virtualization enables psychopathy. So in normal social situations, if you're a narcissistic Machiavellian and you push it too hard, someone will absolutely hit you. And that will be the end of it. And most of the time it's cowards who take that route and it doesn't take much intimidation to stop them. Just the hint of appropriate, just retaliation will keep them silent. But online, especially if you're anonymous, that's all stripped away and so the psychopaths can have free reign. And part of the reason that our culture is being torn apart at the moment is because virtualization enables psychopathy. And so that's a big problem. Let's say you have a robot that can learn a little bit, not much, but then let's say you have 20 million of them and they're all exactly the same and they have exactly the same architecture. And so what that means, as soon as one robot learns something, then all 20 million of them learn it. And so if each robot is learning one thing a day, then the whole herd is learning 20 million things a day. In a sobering interview that sent shockwaves throughout the tech world, Jordan spoke out about the existential threat posed by artificial intelligence urging us to approach this powerful technology with caution and foresight. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world, and so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well, because they'll be able to model human action. With a sense of urgency and a touch of dread in his voice, Jordan issued a stark warning to humanity about the perils of unchecked AI development, imploring us to take action before it's too late. They're always after the next new thing as fast as possible, so it's a machine that's speeding along as fast as a machine possibly can. And, and God only knows where it's headed in some sense, right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to keep track. And we don't even know what these things are. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. And what's really interesting about robots like that is that they basically, ha they're all identical, right? More or less. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when one learns something, every one of them learns it at the same time. And so even if they're not very bright, if there's 10 million of them, or 100 million of them, and they're all learning one thing a day, that's 100 million new things a day that every one of them is learning. And so they're mapping the road and they're learning how to operate in a natural environment, which is a really big deal. Like it's a really, really big deal. They're learning to map the perception of the world onto action, which is really the definition, a good definition in some sense of intelligence. We don't even know 
if we need to be worried about Facebook, because God only knows if it'll even exist in five years. It could even be the same with Google. So, you know, we're worried about machines that are changing so fast that we can't figure out what exactly we should be worried about. Because, I mean, who was thinking about YouTube five years ago? No one. It's like cute cat videos. Who cares about YouTube? But it turns out that YouTube is an unbelievably powerful social force because it makes the spoken word as universally transmissible and as permanent as the written word, right? So it's a Gutenberg revolution. And it might even be more profound than Gutenberg revolution because it's possible that people can listen better than they can read. And they can listen when they're doing other things, which is what happens in the podcast world. And lots of my students now listen to podcasts instead of listening to music, or they listen to podcasts instead of reading. You know, they speed them up. I mean, these are massive, massive technological changes, and they're all happening in parallel. We have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be. After humans become completely dependent on AI, and we either merge or become a zoo, where can we find meaning? <laughs> well, there's a lot of hypotheticals in that question. Um, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that because I don't, I don't think it's within the scope of anyone's vision to, to, to predict even what's likely to happen over the next 40 years because the rate of technological advance is so insane that in some sense all bets are off. And I really mean that. Um, you know, I, I have a variety of contacts in Silicon Valley and there are people there that I've been communicating with who believe that it's already within their power to build a, an AI machine that will have higher computational capacity than the human brain. That's within five years. Now that assumes that they've got the computational capacity of the brain properly calculated, and that's not necessarily the case. But even if they're out by a factor of 10, that's not many iterations past that. Now maybe we don't understand the brain at all. That's certainly possible. Robots have been tricky. You know, but I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's going to happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. You know, pretty soon we'll be contending with the fact that someone will be able to generate a photo realistic version of Donald Trump and have him say something absolutely reprehensible and spread it everywhere just before election night. And there'll be a real confusion about whether he said it or didn't. So what do we do when our representations of reality can be falsified? Now, you know, I was talking to my son about that today, and he thinks we'll get into an arms race right away because there'll be technologies that can detect whether video is artificial. But then, you know, there'll be a race because other technologies will learn how to fool that technology. And, you know, maybe we'll be able to stay on the edge where we can still detect what's real and what isn't. But I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now on social media, you know, because social media, it's kind of like the world, except it's way more demented. And the problem with that is that it makes the whole world look demented. So my concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically. And that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God, but that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us. I'm doing this in my relatively technologically clueless manner. Um, here's one thing I've noticed about getting older. I, I have kept up with computer technology pretty well, I would say, but 
I do find, maybe because of the demands on me in the last year, maybe I'm not stupider. It's possible. So anyways, hi everyone. Um, nice to see you here. Looks like I've got the chat working. Is everything working? Looks like it. All right, so I'm going to start with some questions that people sent me. Anyways, thank you for all, be, for all you, you for being here, by the way. It's very much appreciated. Um, it's quite remarkable, as far as I'm concerned, that you tune in to listen to me talk with you. I definitely do appreciate it. So I'm going to start with some of the questions that people sent me earlier, and I'll keep an eye on the chat, YouTube chat as well. So um, hopefully the audio is good. What about that? How's the audio there, guys? So now Adam W. Patterson asked me a question that got 410 votes. He said, um, I am a web software developer. Are you hiring or can I volunteer for anything? I can build anything. I can automate things. I could simply be an assistant of sorts. Thank you for your time. Well, what I would like to say about that is first, thank you, Adam. It's much appreciated. And a lot of people have volunteered their time to me and their, and their, um, it isn't just the rapid increase in computational power that's doubling so quickly. I don't know if any of you, how many of you watched the Boston Dynamics videos? So how many of you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so one of the things I would highly recommend is that you go home and go to YouTube and, and look up Boston Dynamics because it's the most advanced robotics company in the world and it was a DARPA project, so a, an American defense uh, company and they were bought by Google five years ago and they had pretty damn impressive robots five years ago. They were autonomous and, and uh, so they could, they could uh, make their way over rough terrain, including snow, up hills, if they slipped on the ice, they could right themselves. If you pushed them over, they could put, put themselves back up. And that's not joystick controlled. That was all autonomous. And they ran on gasoline powered motors and were capable of, of autonomous action for an hour and a half or so. And I looked at the last iteration and it's a small robot about this big and it has a hand that looks like a head. And it's so sophisticated that it can it can gyrate to music spontaneously and it can keep its head in the same place while it does it like a chicken. And so, and it can open doors, and it's like it's it's quite the remarkable creature. And and the the rate of advance from the first robot, which was called Big Dog, which is a very terrifying thing to 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 watch, Big Dog, to this is quite staggering. And that's only going to increase insanely that that ability over the next five years. And you know, there's something very strange about robots that people don't generally think about. Some people do. Imagine you have a robot and it can learn a few things through imitation and we already have robots that can do that because you can program a robot, industrial robot that's worth about $20,000. You can move its arm the way you want it to move its arm and then it will move its arm that way. And so the, once, once, once we hit a certain threshold, the rate of increase in robotic intelligence is going to be just something that we can't even comprehend. I talked to the people at uh, Tesla who ran the autonomous car division and they know perfectly well they weren't creating autonomous cars because an autonomous car isn't a car it's a robot and it's not just a robot it's a fleet of robots and it's a fleet of intelligent robots and some of the functions that it will perform will be the functions of a car but to think about that as a car is just you're just confused it's like to think of a car as a horseless carriage um, the, the person who ran the division told me that They'd already had plans instantiated so that all the Tesla cars map the roads and they're mapping them at an increasingly high level of resolution and then they share the data and they expected to get to the point where the car would be able to predict where the bumps on the road were that it was approaching and adjust the suspension so that when you hit the bump you wouldn't feel that at all because the suspension would have mapped the bump before it encountered it. And so, and that's just, you know, it seems like a trivial example in some sense, but it's not trivial. It's, it's, it's an example of how unbelievably quickly this technology is progressing. So, now, what are we going to do about that? Well, I'm hoping that we're going to be smart enough as individuals and careful enough and ethical enough and, and fast so that when we, when we, as we continue to produce increasingly intelligent computers and robots that are going to mimic us, that they mimic something good enough so that it doesn't destroy us. 
And so a lot of that's going to depend on the ethical integrity of the people who are working on these advanced systems. And it's not like the people who are working on those systems, at least some of them don't understand that, because they do, and they also understand the tremendous danger that this poses. You should know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just going to make your hair stand on end within the next year, because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months, that it's almost unimaginable. AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon. And that's basically what scientists do, right? Because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world. And if the hypothesis in the world fit, then you think, well, that's scientifically verified. And Keller thinks that, that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon. And pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because the tech is already in place. And so I have no idea what that's going to mean. You know, and it could easily lead us astray. So here's something that's going to happen in the next year. So imagine now you're a lonesome, lonesome guy, and you can uh, get a digital friend, a woman, and uh, she can talk to you like ChatGPT talks to you and listen like ChatGPT listens to you, which is maybe if you're really lonesome and alienated, more than anyone has ever listened to you in your life. And then soon, she'll not only listen to you as a text interface, but she'll be a fully rendered 3D, well, let's say 2D photorealistic, fully rendered animation, indistinguishable from a genuine image of a person, image of a genuine person. And then that'll be 3D for your, you know, Oculus headset. And then, well, that'll be sexual and like just right now, that'll be the That'll be the value proposition, right? Is you'll be able to turn your virtual girlfriend into your virtual sex partner. And who knows what that'll do? So you're envisioning a future very rapidly. It's already here where we're already androids. With each resonating syllable, Jordan Peterson's voice pierces the veil of naivete. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform, but robots, they are heralding an era where boundaries between man and machine blur, where the echoes of progress reverberate through our very souls. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world, and so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well because they'll build a model human action. In the crucible of innovation, Jordan Peterson's clarion call echoes. For he knows that the arrival of AI is not merely an evolution, but an epochal shift that will redefine the essence of what it means to be human. But you can certainly see how that's going to get out of hand in a staggering way, like it has in China on the digital currency front. Because once every single bloody thing that you buy can be tracked, let's say by a government agency, then a tremendous amount of your identity has now become public property. Amidst the cascading waves of uncertainty, Jordan Peterson's prophetic insight casts a glaring light upon the impending collision of technological prowess and human destiny as the emergence of AI threatens to rewrite the very script of our existence, as I'm sure we're all more than well aware. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. Like a modern day Cassandra, Jordan Peterson warns of a Pandora's box unlocked, where the tantalizing promise of artificial intelligence may lead to untold wonders or, you know, unleash a tidal wave of devastation that reshapes the very contours of our world. Well, I guess the downside would be, you know, is it is it possible 
for it to exist in a very protected environment. Now, you've been working on that technically, so a couple of practical questions there is this gadget that you've been starting to develop, do you have anything approximating a commercial timeline for its release? In the chasms of human curiosity, Jordan Peterson confronts the inevitable clash between progress and prudence, challenging us to embrace the transformative power of AI while wrestling with the profound ethical and existential quandaries that it begets. The autonomous cars that are being developed, you know, people still think about those as cars, but that isn't what they are. They're autonomous self-learning robots. And the fact that they happen to take the form of cars at the moment is almost irrelevant. You know, they're no more cars than cars were horseless buggies, right? They're a whole new thing. And what's really interesting about robots like that is that they basically, they're all identical, right? More or less. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when one learns something, every one of them learns it at the same time. And so even if they're not very bright, if there's 10 million of them or 100 million of them, and they're all learning one thing a day. That's a hundred million new things a day that every one of them is learning. And so they're mapping the road and they're learning how to operate in a natural environment, which is a really big deal. Like it's a really, really big deal. They're learning to map the perception of the world onto action, which is really the definition, a good definition in some sense of intelligence. I've been thinking about doing that on, the, on something approximating the IQ testing front. You know, because people keep gerrymandering the measurement of general cognitive ability. But I could imagine putting together a, a sophisticated blockchain corpus of, let's say, general knowledge questions. A very And ChatGPT can generate those like mad, by the way. So you can imagine a data bank of 150,000 general knowledge questions that was blockchain, so nobody can muck about with the answers from which you could derive random samples of general ability tests that would be, well, they'd be 100% robust, reliable, and valid, and nobody could, met, nobody could gerrymander them. Just the way Bitcoin stops fiat currency producers from inflating the currency, the same thing could happen on the knowledge front. So I guess that's the sort of thing that you're, that you're referring to. AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon, and that's basically what scientists do, right? Because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world, and if the hypothesis and the world fit, then you think, well, that's scientifically verified, and Keller thinks that, that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon. And pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because we, the tech is already in place. And so, I have no idea what that's going to mean. You know, and it could easily lead us astray. So here's something that's going to happen in the next year. So imagine now you're a lonesome, lonesome guy, and you can, uh, you can get a digital friend, woman, and uh, she can talk to you like ChatGPT talks to you and listen like ChatGPT listens to you, which is maybe if you're really lonesome and alienated, more than anyone has ever listened to you in your life. And then soon she'll not only listen to you as a text interface, but she'll be a fully rendered 3D, well, let's say 2D photorealistic, fully rendered animation indistinguishable from a genuine image of a person, image of a genuine person, and then that'll be 3D for your, you know, Oculus headset, and then, well, that'll be sexual in like, just right now, that'll be the, that'll be the value proposition, right, is you'll be able to turn your virtual girlfriend into your virtual sex partner, and who knows what that'll do? Robots have been tricky. You know, but I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's going to happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. You know, pretty soon we'll be contending with the fact that someone will be able to generate a photo realistic version of Donald Trump and have him say something absolutely reprehensible and spread it everywhere just before election night. And there'll be a real confusion about whether he said it or didn't. So what do we do when our representations of reality can be falsified? 
Now, you know, I was talking to my son about that today, and he thinks we'll get into an arms race right away because there'll be technologies that can detect whether video is artificial, but then, you know, there'll be a race because other technologies will learn how to fool that technology, and, you know, maybe we'll be able to stay on the edge where we can still detect what's real and what isn't, but I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now on social media, you know, because social media... It's kind of like the world, except it's way more demented. And the problem with that is that it makes the whole world look demented. So my concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically. And that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God, but that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us. You know, you hear babies have no theory of mind. It's like, uh, yeah, no, they can imitate. That's pretty bloody amazing, man. Like you haven't seen robots that can do that yet. Although there are robots now that you can teach by moving their, their arms. You move their arms and then they'll do it. And so you can actually program them by moving them and then they'll just repeat it. And so they're getting damn close to imitation. They're really getting close and then look the hell out, man, because they're going to be imitating each other as well as us. And they're going to do it so fast, you just won't be able to believe it. Now, the guys that are building the autonomous cars, like they don't think they're building autonomous cars. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They're building fleets of mutually intercommunicating autonomous robots and each of them will be able to teach the other because their nervous system will be the same. And when there's 10 million of them, when one of them learns something, all 10 million of them will learn it at the same time. So they're not gonna have to be very bright before they're very, very, very smart. Because us, you know, we'll learn something, you have to imitate it, it's like, God, that's hard. Or I have to explain it to you and you have to understand it and then you have to act it out. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform, but robots, they are. And so once those things get a little bit smart, they're not gonna stop at a little bit smart for very long. They're gonna be unbelievably smart, like overnight, so. And they're imitating the hell out of us right now too, because we're teaching them how to understand us. Every second of every day, the net is learning what we're like. It's watching us, it's communicating with us, it's imitating us, and it's gonna know, it already knows in some ways more about us than we know about ourselves. You know, there's lots of reports already of people getting um, pregnancy, ads or ch ads for infants, sometimes before they know they're pregnant, but often before they've told their families. And the way that that happens is the net is watching what they're looking at and inferring with its artificial intelligence. And so maybe you're pregnant and that's just tilting you a little bit, right? To interest in things that you might not otherwise be interested in. The net tracks that, then it tells you what you're, what you're after. and does that by offering you an advertisement. So it's reading your unconscious mind. So, you're envisioning a future very rapidly, it's already here, where we're already androids. And that is already the case because a human being with an iPhone is an android. Now, we're kind of, we're still mostly biological androids, but it isn't obvious how long that's going to be the case. And so, what that means, like I've, I've, I've laughed for years, you know, I have a hard drive on which everything I've worked on has now been stored since 1984. And I joke, you know, there's more of me in the hard drive than there is in me. And <laughs> it's not a joke really, you know, because- Yeah, it's, it's real. It's, it's real. real, right. There's tens of thousands of documents on that hard drive. And weirdly enough, I know where every single one of them is. So- Wow. So, so now, we're, we're going to be in a situation. So what that means is we're in a situation now where a lot of, act, of what actually constitutes our identity has become digital. And we're, we're already being trafficked and enslaved in relationship to that digital identity, mostly by credit card companies. Now, I would say to some degree, they're benevolent masters because the credit card companies watch what you spend and so how you behave, where you go, and they broker that information to other interested capitalist parties. Now, the downside of that obviously is that these parties know often more about you than you know about yourself. I've read stories, for example, of advertisements for baby clothes being targeted to women 
who A, didn't know they're pregnant, or if they did, hadn't revealed it to anyone else. We don't even know if we need to be worried about Facebook, because God only knows if it'll even exist in five years. It could even be the same with Google. So, you know, we're worried about machines that are changing so fast that we can't figure out what exactly we should be worried about. Because, I mean, who was thinking about YouTube five years ago? No one. It's like cute cat videos. Who cares about YouTube? But it turns out that YouTube is an unbelievably powerful social force because it makes the spoken word as universally transmissible and as permanent as the written word, right? So it's a Gutenberg revolution. And it might even be more profound than Gutenberg revolution because it's possible that people can listen better than they can read. And they can listen when they're doing other things, which is what happens in the podcast world. And lots of my students now listen to podcasts instead of listening to music, or they listen to podcasts instead of reading. You know, they speed them up. I mean, these are massive, massive technological changes, and they're all happening in parallel. We have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be. A, a self-help book is like that in a primitive way. I mean, yes. because it's essentially, it's essentially a spiritual guide in that if you equate the movement of the spirit with forward movement through the world, like faith-based forward movement through the world, and so this would be the next, the next iteration of that in some sense. I mean, that's what we've been experimenting with this system that I mentioned that contains all the lectures yeah. that I've given and so forth. I mean, you can now ask it questions, which means it's, it's a book, but it's a book personalized to your query. It isn't just the rapid increase in computational power that's doubling so quickly. I don't know if any of you, how many of you watch the Boston Dynamics videos? So, how many of you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so one of the things I would highly recommend is that you go home and go to YouTube and, and look up Boston Dynamics, because it's the most advanced robotics company in the world, and it was a DARPA project, so a, an American defense uh, company, and they were bought by Google five years ago, and they had pretty damn impressive robots five years ago. They were autonomous, and, and uh, so they could, they could uh, make their way over rough terrain, including snow, up hills. If they slipped on the ice, they could right themselves. If you pushed them over, they could pu put themselves back up. And that's not joystick controlled. That was all autonomous. And they ran on gasoline-powered motors and were capable of, of autonomous action for an hour and a half or so. And I looked at the last iteration, and it's a small robot about this big, and it has a hand that looks like a head. And it's so sophisticated that it can, it can gyrate to music spontaneously, and it can keep its head in the same place while it does it, like a chicken. And so, and it can open doors, and it's like, it's, it's quite the remarkable creature. And, and the, the rate of advance from the first robot, which was called Big Dog, which is a very terrifying thing to, to, to watch Big Dog, to this is quite staggering, and that's only going to increase insanely that, that ability over the next five years. And you know, there's something very strange about robots that people don't generally think about, some people do. Imagine you have a robot and it can learn a few things through imitation and we already have robots that can do that because you can program a robot, industrial robot that's worth about $20,000. You can move its arm the way you want it to move its arm and then it will move its arm that way.